Hello and welcome to this webinar series on satellite observations for analyzing natural hazards on small island nations. Today is the second part of this three-part series and it's focused on assessing sea level rise at the local to regional scale using Earth observations. Our guest speaker is Dr. Ben Hamlington, who's a scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and team lead of the NASA Sea Level Change Team. Thank you very much, Ben, for sharing your vast expertise on sea level change in this RSET training. All right. Thanks, Erica, for the introduction. Um, so, as Erica said, my name is Ben Hamilton, and I am a research scientist here at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory and also team lead of the NASA Sea Level Change Team. And a lot of the, the work I do is trying to study and understand sea level and the changes that occur using observations from both space and observations we take here in the ocean. So that's really what I want to talk to you a little bit about today. So the title of this presentation is Assessing Sea Level Rise at the Regional to Local Scale Using Earth Observations. And again, I'm going to focus on a wide range of observing systems, how we put pieces together to really understand what's going on in the ocean. So just as a starting point here, I want to provide just this little cartoon image, just this really simplified look at how um, the, the coastlines are set up relative to the ocean. And we're going to start by looking at sea level in the past. So in the past, we had sea level. We have what we call mean sea level. So you can really treat that as the foundation of sea level. So kind of that average sea level that uh, is slowly going up with global warming, which I'll talk about more in a little bit. But on top of that foundation of sea level, we have natural variability that occurs. It's occurred in the past. It continues to occur now, and it'll keep happening in the future. And then we have tides, waves, winds, storms, all this other stuff on top of that. And if you're trying to assess what sea level is at any given time, it's really the combination of all these things. So you put all the pieces together, and that's where sea level is at any given time. So coastal communities were built with this amount of sea level in mind in the past, right? So you build a certain safety gap, we call it freeboard. So that's basically where your typical high tide occurs and where you're living on land. So where you're building your infrastructure, your buildings, your houses, your businesses. And in the past, you had a pretty big safety gap, right? So in order to get into flooding conditions, you need a big storm or something to come through, cause sea level to increase a lot, and then that's when flooding would occur. But things have been changing. So if we go forward, so this is what I'm calling sea level now. So you have these same factors that are occurring. You have mean sea level, you have this natural variability, you have tides, waves, winds, all of that stuff is still present. But on top of that, you've had sea level rise associated with global warming. So this is partially from melting of ice and the, um, the ice sheets and glaciers that goes into the ocean cause sea level to increase, but also thermal expansion. So as the water warms, it expands and sea level goes higher. So again, I'll talk about mo more about this in the presentation. But as you start to add these things up, then you really narrow that safety gap. So that safety gap becomes much, much smaller. And it really doesn't take much of a push to get into flooding conditions. So you don't need a big storm to come through um, in order to get the flooding conditions. It could be natural variability combined with this sea level rise, and that could get you into flooding conditions. So the reason I'm covering this is it's really important that we factor in all these different processes that are contributing to sea level and really understand the spatial and time scales, the space and time scales upon which sea level varies. So here I've broken it down a little bit further into local, regional, and global. And that's really important because when we're talking about satellite observations, we're able to see things on different scales. Some of our satellites give us a really nice global view. Other satellites allow us to drill down into more local areas. Um, so using these different observations, putting the pieces together, uh, we can really start to understand why sea level is changing. And in this presentation, I'm gonna focus on three specific things. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about natural variability. I'm going to talk about sea level rise associated with this ice melt and global warming of the ocean. Then I'm also going to talk about something called subsidence. So we're really concerned about relative sea level rise at the coast, right? So it's not just how the ocean is rising, but also how the land is moving up and down. And a lot of our coastal areas, we're actually seeing what we call subsidence. So that's where the land is sinking. And that has the effect of having an increase in, in what we call relative sea level. So it's very important we understand subsidence as well. All right, so I've already touched on this a little bit, but why is sea level rise going up on a global scale, right? So we will talk about what's happening on regional and local levels, but if we're talking about global climate change, why is sea level increasing? So there's really two reasons that sea level is increasing on global scales. One is that the ocean is warming. So a lot of the heat that's getting trapped in our climate system gets absorbed by the ocean, and then that water expands. So when water warms up, it expands, and that's what we call thermal expansion. 
The other way that global sea level rise is increasing is because ice on land is melting and that meltwater has to go somewhere and in a lot of cases it goes into the ocean. So you're really just increasing the amount of water that's in the ocean. So these two things combined really do start to give us this increase in global sea level that we've been seeing over the past century and even more recently with the satellites over the past uh, couple decades. So with our observations, we can really start to understand these individual factors, right? So it's really important that we understand not just how fast sea level is increasing, but also why it's increasing. So if we can understand why it's increasing, we can make better assessments of what might be happening in the future. So I'm just breaking this down into a, a kind of equation that we're going to go into um, in some of these uh, uh, slides that, uh, that are about to follow. Um, but if we break this down into ice, plus thermal expansion should equal total sea level when we're talking about this global change, right? So if we understand the contribution from ice, the contribution from thermal expansion, those two things together should add up to give us the total sea level that we've seen, that we uh, see now and, and potentially will see in the future. And we actually have observing systems for each one of these. So for ice, we have something called GRACE follow-on. For thermal expansion, we have the Argo profiling floats. And for total sea level, we have what we call satellite altimetry. And I'm going to go through each one of these individually, tell you how those systems work, um, what data we have, and what measurements we get from those data. So I want to start out by focusing on altimetry, which gives us a measurement of total sea level. All right, before talking about the satellite itself, I think it's important we try to understand how we measure global sea level in the past. All right, so for the last century, tide gauges have really been the way that we've used uh, or the main, the main method we've used to measure sea level change along the world's coastlines. So I have a couple images here on the, the right showing some tide gauges. So that one image on the upper left there is the tide gauge in San Francisco. So that's the, actually the oldest um, tide gauge in the United States going back to 1854. On the right is a little schematic about how these um, tide gauges actually measure sea level. So it's a relatively simple process where you're basically measuring the height of the ocean at that one specific location. And then from there, we have this um, image at the bottom, which shows you where we have tide gauges around the world's coastlines. So there's one important thing to note about tide gauges. They have to be located on land, right? So if you don't have an island, if you don't have a coastline, you're not going to have a tide gauge. And related to that, those, that tide gauge is going to be affected by the movement of the land upon which it sits. So these tide gauges are really measuring relative sea level. So they include the effect of subsidence in their measurements. So one important thing to note in that bottom image is there's huge parts of the ocean that are just not covered. We don't have an observation. We don't know what sea level has been doing in the past in some of those locations, especially in the interior of oceans. So when you're trying to assess global sea level, it can be really challenging. All right, so now let's fast forward to the past couple of decades. So since 1992, we've been using something called satellite altimeters. So these are used to measure what we call sea surface height in the ocean. And they're continuous measurements with near global coverage. And I'll talk about what that means in terms of near global coverage. Some of you may have seen that uh, NASA launched a satellite last year, the Sentinel-6A Michael Freilich. Um, it continues this record of satellite altimetry um, and, and a really nice long record, again, which I'll talk more about in a second. But the measurement principle of an altimeter is actually really easy. So if you're driving down the highway and some of you have been, say, pulled over for speeding, for instance, it's a very similar technology to what that police officer has used to understand how fast you're moving. So it's basically the satellite takes... Uh, it, knowing very accurately where that satellite is on orbit, it's up in space, we can understand the height of it really well using GPS. That satellite sends a radar pulse down from the satellite to the surface of the ocean. And that radar pulse bounces off the surface of the ocean and travels back to the satellite. So if we can measure really accurately how long it takes that pulse to get from the satellite to the surface of the ocean and back to the satellite, coupled with our understanding of where that satellite is in space, we can get a really accurate measurement of sea level from space down to about one inch or a couple centimeters. So it's really impressive how accurate of a measurement we can get from space using these altimeters. And uh, I'm showing here a picture of the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich um, satellite. It does look a little bit like a house or a dog house, which a lot of people have noted. Um, that's just kind of the orientation we, we uh, or the setup that we use for this satellite. Satellite altimeters in the past certainly look a little bit different, but I think that's uh, something interesting. Everyone notes about the design of, of this uh, particular satellite. 
Um, but I have a couple images here just to show a little bit more how this works. So this is a little animation of Sentinel-6 flying, and you can see that it has this spot size, and there's a little red pulse that's coming down and hitting off the surface of the ocean. And underneath the satellite, as it orbits around the Earth, we can get a measurement of sea surface height. And you start to build these measurements up, and you get a complete view of the ocean over the course of about 10 days. So we have what you call a 10-day repeat orbit. So every 10 days, we get a complete mapping of the ocean. Now, if you consider that in comparison to what I show with the tide gauges, it's obviously a vastly different picture that we're able to get of the, the ocean. We don't have to be located on land or on an island. We get a very good view of what's changing on a global scale. I want to show this one other way. Let me click forward here. So this is a, a different animation. So basically, this is showing the um, satellite altimeter measurements we have through time and uh, the, some of the different features that happen in the ocean. Because a lot of times when we think about sea surface height, and sea level changes, we think it's a relatively smooth and flat process. And some people like to think of a bathtub, like a bathtub going up and down. And in reality, there's just all kinds of stuff going on in the ocean. And there's a lot of variability. And it's, it's really very noisy. A lot of things going, a lot of things are happening all at once. So let me play this. Um, so again, this is just going to do a little animation that you can see the tracks there. So each of those are the, the tracks made over one complete uh, cycle, so one 10 day cycle, and you can see how things are moving through time, right? So sea level is going up and down in some of these locations. There's little features that are moving all around, um, but we really do have this very complete image of sea level um, on a global scale. And you're about to see, if you look in the Pacific there, you'll see that big El Nino that happened 1997, 98. Um, but again, we have all these different features. We have really good measurements with satellites. And from that, we can actually measure what we call global mean sea level. So we take all those observations across the globe from the satellites, we average them together. So we just take an average every 10 days, and then we can generate this time series um, that uh, shows a really smooth, relatively smooth increase in global sea level since 1993, so 1993 to present. So the rate of change here, so basically how fast sea level is increasing, is about three millimeters per year. So that may not seem like a lot, three millimeters is a relatively small amount, but there's two things to note. That is happening year over year over year. So over time, that starts to stack up. So when we talk about that foundation of sea level rise, like what I showed on the first slide, that three millimeters is increasing and closing that safety gap year over year. The other important thing here to note is that it's accelerating. So for the first decade of the altimeter record, our rate of change was two millimeters per year. For the second decade, it was three millimeters per year. In the most recent decade, it was four millimeters per year. So that rate is actually increasing over time and expected to continue to do so into the future. So with these satellite altimeter measurements, we understand global mean sea level and the rate at which it's changing really well over the past three decades. So just to show you kind of this record we built up with the satellites, so starting in 1992, we launched the, to uh, the Topex Poseidon satellite altimeter, and then we picked up with the Jason series. So Jason 1, Jason 2, Jason 3. This most recent one is Jason CS, or the Sentinel-6A, Michael Freilich, has a variety of names. Um, and we have plans to launch Sentinel-6B um, in 2025. So as we start to build these records up, we're going to have a record length of 40 years, so a really long record where we can really understand the changes that are occurring and the climate system. So why is this long record so important? This is one of the crowning achievements for sea level science and for engineering at NASA in order to have this really long continuous record. So there's been no gap. If you look at those dates, these satellites overlap with each other, right? So there, there's been no gap. We have one overlapping the next and we have this continuous record. So why is that so important? In order to understand that, we can look at what's happened to sea level in the past. Um, so using those tide gauges and a kind of a complicated analysis, we can actually recreate a global mean sea level time series going all the way back to 1900. So if we compare what we see during the satellite record to what we see in the past over the 20th century, we can start to see and get some context for the satellite record itself. And you can see at different time periods in the past, sea level has been higher or lower, or sea level rise has been higher or lower. Um, if you look at that period from, say, 1960 to 1980, global mean sea level is actually relatively flat. And the reason for that is that a lot of dams were being built around the globe. So a lot of the water 
that could have been going to the ocean was being trapped on land. So it actually caused a decrease in sea level over that time period. But since about 1970, we've seen this persistent rise and consistent acceleration in sea level rise. And that's really that time period that we see the satellite altimeter record imprinted upon. So it's important to keep this record going into the future so we can start to monitor these changes that are occurring in the climate system. If we start to do things to try to lessen the amount of sea level rise, again, it's important to understand and be able to see that in these satellite observations and compare them to what we had in the past. All right, so we've talked about the right side here, the total sea level from the altimetry. Now I wanna to shift to talk about the left side. So when we have these different components, can we understand each individual component well enough to see if they agree with what we have observed in the altimetry? And when I start out with, oops, sorry, when I start out with the GRACE, what we call the GRACE satellites and the GRACE follow-on satellites, which measure the ice contribution to global sea level rise. All right, so GRACE stands for the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. So um, GRACE, the first one was launched from 2002. It stopped working in 2016. GRACE follow one was launched more recently in 2018 and still in orbit making our measurements. Um, so what these satellites do is actually measure gravity changes on Earth. And GRACE, or GRACE follow one satellites are trailing each other on orbit, one's in front of the other. And what happens, and I'll show an image of this, uh, a video on the left, uh, bottom left here, but I'm gonna explain it first on the right using, or using the image on the right. But these satellites move and the distance between them adjusts as they fly over Earth. Okay, so just to, to be clear, the only measurement these two satellites are making are the distance between them. Okay, so imagine in the top right panel there that you're coming up to a mountain uh, or something very massive here on Earth. It has a lot of gravity associated with it, a big gravitational pull. As that first satellite gets close to it, it gets pulled towards that mass and the distance between the two satellites increases. It's being pulled faster than the one behind it. Now, as that first satellite flies over top of that mass, if we look at the third panel, it gets pulled back towards that mass while the other one is getting pushed forward. So that distance really decreases very rapidly. So these, there's this constant interplay between these satellites as they fly around the surface of the Earth. And by making that measurement of the distance between those two satellites, we can actually back out the gravity changes here on Earth. So let me show this animation real quick, which will um, give it a little bit of different, different view. So that's actually not a connection between those two satellites, that line that was there. That's really just the laser that's making that measurement between them. But you can see these two, one following the other orbiting around Earth. You can see that first one getting pulled forward from the second, and then now the second one's going to catch up and you're gonna have this back and forth that's happening on orbit. And here's another way of seeing it. So you can see as you go over this hill here, this mountain, first one gets pulled towards it, and the second one gets pulled towards it, and the first one goes back. So this, this constant interplay, this dance that occurs between these two satellites um, up on orbit. So if we talk about what these measurements, <clears throat> excuse me, these measurements actually tell us. So one of the main reasons that gravity is changing here on Earth is because of changes in our, in our ice mass. So if we're talking about the, the big ice sheets associated with Greenland and Antarctic, when they start to lose ice, GRACE is able to see that. So this is a, these are actually observations from GRACE and GRACE follow-on. I'm gonna show this animation. Actually, this is just from GRACE. We haven't included the GRACE follow-on part. Um, but we can see not only that Greenland has been losing ice over time, but also where Greenland is losing ice from. So these orange areas, orange red areas are areas where ice has been lost. So again, we launched GRACE in 2002, it stopped working in 2016. But you start to see that some locations are losing ice faster than others. And this is changing over time, but we get this really good image of of where ice is being lost, how much ice is being lost. And from that, by calculating the volume or essentially the mass of ice that's going into the ocean, we can really start to infer what the change in sea level might be. So I also wanna show for, this is for Antarctic. And what's interesting here is that parts of the Antarctic ice sheet were actually gaining mass during this time period. So you're gonna see some areas of blue which actually represent uh, mass gain. But overall, the Antarctic ice sheet is losing mass. Um, especially looking at the West Antarctic ice sheet there. 
So again, you go through time, you can see where, see where we're really losing ice very quickly. This is important too, as we start to understand why some locations are losing ice faster than others. Is it connected to changes in the atmosphere, changes in the ocean? These are really critical observations, not just the ice sheet is losing mass, but where it is losing mass. And then from that, we can start to improve our scientific understanding. All right, so now if we take those measurements, we combine them all, we, we understand how much ice is being lost and then how much water is going into the ocean. We average all that together across the globe. And we understand that from this ice mass loss from GRACE, we're seeing a rate of change of about two millimeters per year from 2005, or two, sorry, 2002 on up through the present. Okay, so that's the ice contribution to global mean sea level. And if you remember back, the rate of change for the altimetry was about three millimeters per year. There's a slightly different time period here that we're covering. But we can start to say about two thirds of what we see in altimetry is related to ice mass loss. All right, so now if we go to this last piece, this thermal expansion Argo, if everything's working out, this equation sets up right, we know two thirds of our, of our global mean sea level contribution is coming from ice, that means we should have about a third coming from thermal expansion and from Argo. These are Argo profile floats. So let me talk about these Argo floats here uh, for just a second. So this is not a satellite measurement. These are actually floats that are in the ocean. So since 2005, these Argo profiling floats have been measuring temperature and salinity of the ocean from about zero meters, so that's at the surface, down to 2,000 meters below the surface. So what happens, these uh, Argo floats or go into the ocean, they descend to a certain depth, and then they drift for about 10 days. So they're moving around the ocean, they're going with the ocean currents, they uh, can, they're, not, they're not staying in one place, they're drifting, they're profiling floats, it's kind of there in the name. Um, so on that 10th day, what that float does is it goes down to 2,000 meter depth, and then it slowly starts to rise to the surface. And as it's rising to the surface, it's making measurements of salinity and temperature that whole time. So it's measuring how warm and how salty the ocean column is, the water column is. And then when it gets to the surface, it sends that information, that data it collected back to a satellite, and then we can start to work with that data. So from these measurements, we can estimate the impact of thermal expansion on sea level rise. We're measuring the temperature and salinity of the ocean um, wherever these profiling floats are. And at any given time, we have between 3,000 and 4,000 of these floats in the ocean. So it's not quite as good as what we have with the satellites, but we actually do have good measurements of the, of the global ocean. All right, so let's take those observations we have from Argo. We'll add them together, average them, and you end up getting a rate of change associated with thermal expansion. Another word for that is steric change or steric height. Um, and that rate of change is about 1.1 millimeters per year. And I'm sure a lot of you are already doing the math in your head, adding up the thermal expansion contribution, the ice contribution. And we see that this equation actually works out pretty well. Okay, so if you add these things up, so here I'm showing everything on the same, same plot. I know it's very busy, but um, that orange line, orange red line at the bottom, that's the thermal expansion from Argo. The green line is the global ocean mass change from GRACE and GRACE follow-on. And then that blue is what we see from the satellite altimeters. If we add up the green line and the orange line, you end up with a yellow line. And you can see that they overlap really quite nicely. There are some changes, some deviations that occur um, from year to year. But in terms of the rate of increase, we have about 1.3 millimeters per year um, and thermal expansion from 2005 to 2019. What I showed in the previous slide was a slight update from these numbers from when this figure was created. 2.1 millimeter per year for the mass increase and 3.3 millimeter for total sea level trend. So you can see that we're very close to being able to what we call close the budget, right? So we understand why sea level is changing on a uh, global scale. We understand this because of the observations we have, not just of total sea level with the altimetry, but also the individual processes. All right. So I, I spent a, quite a bit of time convincing you that we really do understand why global sea level is changing. But if we're talking about planning, coastal planning, the needs of a practitioner, it's really the change that happens at the regional scale that matters, right? So if I'm trying to plan for sea level rise off the coast of California, where I live, for instance, that global number is important. It tells me how the climate is warming and how Earth and the ocean is changing. But really, I want to know how much sea level is changing off the coast of California. 
And as I already said, the ocean does not move up and down like a bathtub, right? So there's a lot of things that call regional variability. So if we take, this is another way of looking at those satellite altimetry observations and seeing how they change across the globe um, from, from one month to the next. So these are monthly averages. I'm gonna play this and you'll see exactly how much is going on in the ocean at any given time. So you'll see a number of features. You see a lot of these really small scale features. We call those eddies. So these are really small, pretty big changes in, in sea surface height that we see moving around the ocean. You see a lot of stuff right in the middle of this map. You see a lot of variability going back and forth across the Pacific Ocean. So this, a lot of this is related to El Nino and La Nina, the opposite of, of El Nino. So the seesaw pattern that's going up and down. Um, you have a lot of stuff going on in the Gulf of Mexico, off the East Coast, and you are going to see over time we're starting to see this warming occur. So things are starting to get a little more yellow, a little more red. If we keep this going forward, I might just skip forward here a little bit. So if we keep going forward, we start to see these increases happening. In some places, we're seeing a sea level fall from month to month. Um, but once we take this data on a regional level, we can do the same thing that we did on a global scale. Right, so we took the data globally and averaged it and tried to understand the trend. We can do that in the regional level too. So for every one of these locations here, we have an underlying time series. If we try to understand the rate of sea level rise um, from this data, this is what you end up with. Okay, so that zero uh, marker, that white, anywhere that's white, is basically no sea level increase from 1992 to 2019. So that means sea level has stayed nice and flat. Anything yellow, orange, red has shown where sea level has increased. So one important thing to note here is that sea level has really gone up almost everywhere, right? So over the past two, three decades, sea level has increased almost everywhere. There's a few pockets here where sea level has gone down a little bit um, for, for a variety of different reasons, but sea level generally has gone up on a global scale, not just on the global average, but also in terms of each location across the globe. The other thing to note is that the rate of change, the amount of change does vary quite a bit. So let's focus on the United States here as a starting point. If you look at the East Coast, the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean, you see quite a bit, pretty dark oranges approaching red. Now let's look off the West Coast of the United States. There you see much lighter colors, actually even approaching kind of the near flat sea level rise over the, uh, the past uh, 20, 30 years. So we have, a, different kinds of variability, different things happening in the ocean that can cause sea level to go up and down in different time periods, and really does require us to have a good understanding of regional sea level change if we're trying to understand what might be happening in the future. All right, so just to, to kind of point to this a little more directly. So sea level changes on a wide range of space and time scales. So there are sea level changes that happen on the order of days, there's some that happen on the order of centuries. So if we're talking about global warming, that's kind of happening on the order of many decades or centuries. But there's also variability that happens on the order of months, years, 10 years, so on. So there's all these things going on that cause a roughness in the ocean and how it's changing. So just as a, a kind of a way of summing this up, the ocean really does not behave like a bathtub, right? So if we even take back our, our previous analogy that I, I had at the, first, um, the very first slide, Imagine that you have mean sea level or this foundation of sea level. That could be the height of your bathtub, the height of the water in your bathtub at any given time. But on top of that, there's all the sloshing that's occurring, right? So imagine you're moving around in the bathtub along with the water. There's a sloshing that's occurring. Sometimes you're sloshing a little bit faster, sometimes a little bit slower, but there's all these different things going on. So contributions to the pattern of regional sea level change, two of the big ones are natural variability. So this is signals like what we call the El Nino Southern Oscillation or North Atlantic Oscillation. So if we're kind of focused on the, the United States here. El Nino Southern Oscillation really impacts the West Coast of the United States. That North Atlantic Oscillation really impacts, impacts the East Coast, the Caribbean, and some of those other locations. And then we also have what we call the ice sheet fingerprints. So I talked a lot about ice melt previously, um, but even that ice melt doesn't fill the ocean like a bathtub. There's gravity changes that occur. I already talked about that with GRACE. That's kind of what GRACE, the GRACE satellite is measuring. And then the ocean responds to those changes in gravity. So again, when ice melts, it doesn't contribute equally to every location across the globe. So let's drill down into these a little bit more. So if we're focusing on El Nino Southern Oscillation specifically, 
right? So El Nino is one of the biggest global climate signals, natural signals that we see. And it has a huge impact on sea level, not just in the Pacific, but actually also on the East Coast of the United States and also for a huge part of the Western Tropical Pacific. So it does cause sea level to increase or fall. So here I'm showing two particular El Ninos, two of the biggest ones we have in the satellite record. The one on the left is the 1997-1998 El Nino. The other one is the 2015-2016 El Nino. So you see this huge increase in sea level that occurs in the Eastern Tropical Pacific and along the West Coast of uh, Mexico, South America, North America, up to 25 centimeters that occurs over the course of a year. Right. And if you compare that to the three millimeters per year of global sea level rise, I was talking about that foundation that's going up. This is actually a huge contribution. So this uh, natural variability can actually really cause flooding or problems to occur in a lot of these coastal areas. On the opposite side, in the western tropical Pacific, you see a pretty big sea level fall associated with El Nino. Now, there's the reverse of this pattern called La Nina. So in that case, western tropical Pacific sea level is much higher and then the eastern tropical Pacific is much lower. So there's kind of seesaw pattern that sets up, but it really has a huge contribution to regional sea level that we need to be very concerned about in coastal communities as we talk about that decreasing safety gap, that decreasing threshold that is present. All right, and the other thing I wanna cover is the ice sheet fingerprints. Okay, so again, I said that because of the gravity changes that occur when ice melts, that water that comes from the melting ice does not fill up the ocean the same everywhere. And actually it's kind of a surprising factor. So this top panel is showing the case when we lose ice from Greenland. And what's interesting to note is that immediately around Greenland, sea level actually falls. Because we have less ice on Greenland, there's less of a gravitational pull towards that ice sheet. And then sea level starts to spread out away from the ice sheet. So the further you are away from the source of ice melt, so the further you are away from Greenland, the more ice melt in Greenland will contribute to our sea level rise. So if you look off the eastern coast of South America, for instance, where you have that dark red in the top panel, Greenland ice melt actually affects that part of the globe more than any other. Okay, so it's kind of surprising. And if we're talking about, again, let's say the Gulf of Mexico, Caribbean, some of those areas, we actually get less than the global average contribution from Greenland. So it affects our sea level, it'll cause it to grow up, go up, but not quite as much as it will in other parts of the world. Now, if we look at the Antarctic ice sheet in the bottom panel there, you see the same thing. So when we're losing ice mass, especially from the West Antarctic ice sheet, sea level actually falls. And if you look at the contribution off of South America now, you actually have a little bit less than the global average and potentially even a sea level fall for the very southern parts of South America. But if you look up further north towards North America and um, some of the, these, uh, these higher regions, we actually see a higher than, than the global average increase in sea level associated with Antarctic ice melt. Okay, so it's not always obvious where this water will go, but from a planning perspective, it's very critical. So if I'm in the, so say I'm in New York, for instance, I'm very concerned about ice melt from the West Antarctic ice sheet because I know I'm gonna get hit really hard by that in the future. Okay, so if I'm talking about, if I see a projection of a huge increase from ice melt there, then I'm going to see this potentially very rapid increase in sea level off uh, of the coast of, of the East coast of the United States in the future. So we can look at this one other way as well. So here I'm breaking it down by two particular cities. So I have all these different sources here in this table of where ice is melting from. So on the left here, I have New York. On the right, I have Sydney. So in both cases, my global contribution of ice melt is the same, right? So Grace is measuring that global contribution. It's about two millimeters per year, but it's not broken out evenly between these two locations. So actually New York sees a little bit less of a contribution from ice melt than Sydney does. And then not only that, the contribution from different sources is dramatically different. So if we look specifically at Greenland there, you can see that Greenland contributes about 0.3, little over 0.3 millimeters per year to New York City. Whereas on the other hand, it contributes about 0.7 millimeters per year to Sydney. I think I said that backwards. So about 0.3 millimeters per year to New York and about 0.7 millimeters per year to Sydney. So it's almost double the contribution in terms of ice melt from Greenland in these two locations.
So it's really important that we're able to understand these ice sheet fingerprints and their contribution to regional sea level change. All right, so I want to shift gears here. I, uh, on that very first slide, I did talk a lot about the ocean side. So we have natural variability, we have global sea level rise, but on the other side of that plot, I, I was showing subsidence that's occurring, right? So sea level is going up, but land could also potentially be going down. And in some locations, that subsidence that we're seeing is at the same level or even bigger than what we see in terms of sea level rise. So understanding this subsidence is really critical. So this is what we call relative sea level, and that subsidence contributes to that relative sea level change. So some of the factors that contribute to this subsidence, this coastal subsidence, groundwater withdrawal is one. So in these coastal communities, a lot of times we're pumping out water directly below us. So as we start to remove that water, it doesn't get replaced in the same way and the land can start to sink. So we start to see subsidence occur. There's something called the glacial isostatic adjustment, so this is basically a response to the little ice age. So because the earth very slowly responds to changes in loading, we actually see subsidence in some parts of the world associated with ice that was present many, many, many years ago. And then the other is uh, associated with tectonics. So um, another thing that contribute to sea level change on ver or to subsidence on very short time periods, if an earthquake occurs or there's movement, tectonic movement, that can also cause subsidence in some of these coastal regions. So there's a variety of ways that we can measure this subsidence. One is that we can use GPS, right? So if we have a GPS station in some of these locations, we can understand how um, the, the land is moving up or down. The way we can do it from space is something called interferometric synthetic aperture radar analysis. And that's a big mouthful. We shorten it to INSAR analysis. But basically it's when a satellite flies over a particular location at one time and then flies over that location again at a different time and then compares the two images that result. So that's a really simplified way of kind of explaining this. You see a really dramatic case there in the upper right where there's a house sitting on a nice level land and then maybe a sinkhole or something terrible happened to that house. Hopefully uh, that's certainly not a house you'd want to live in, but there was this big, big, uh, subsidence signal that happened and the satellite can measure that change over time. So that satellite is really just measuring the change from one pass to another um, over the same location. And this is a specific type of satellite. It's a SAR satellite or a synthetic aperture radar. It's different than the ones I've talked about previously. Um, so Sentinel-1, so I talked about Sentinel-6, which measures total sea level. Sentinel-1 is a satellite that actually provides these measurements. So again, we have a whole fleet of satellites that we use information from, draw information from, to understand how sea level is changing here on Earth. But this is a, just a case study of something that we've, we've done here. So using NSAR in these coastal locations, especially once threatened by sea level, we can estimate vertical land motion. So how much subsidence is occurring for a particular location. And here I'm showing a case study for coastal Virginia. This is for Hampton Roads, Virginia, where there is a, a lot of flooding that does occur over the course of a year. But from this, we can actually start to assess how much, sea, how much subsidence is contributing to the problems we see in, the, in these locations. So an important thing to note here is that there is a lot of kind of speckle or noise. So these satellites are measuring at really high resolutions on the order of tens of meters. Okay, so you're down to kind of the city block level with these measurements. And we can see how subsidence is varying across this location. So in some areas, so if that point E that's there, uh, the land is actually increasing. So it's uplifting. Whereas at that point D, so that's actually a naval shipyard, so that's part of the U.S. Navy and, and where they service ships, you're actually seeing a relatively high rate of subsidence that's happening there. So if this continues on in the future, you can start to assess that we might see bigger impacts associated with coastal flooding in these areas that are subsiding a little bit faster. So again, this is very important information as we try to put the pieces together and really make good assessments about sea level change in the future. All right, so we have, I've discussed a lot about different processes that contribute to sea level change. A lot about how we understand these. What, what observations do we use to understand these changes that are occurring? But when we're talking about impacts of the coast, it's really how these different processes combine, right? That's what's really important. So some of the impacts that we see flooding, so there's something called high tide flooding, which I'll talk about in just a minute. You have coastal erosion, 
saltwater intrusion, coastal migration, so kind of the natural um, ecosystem of a, a coastal area could be affected, could um, be underwater. You have exposed infrastructure. A lot of our infrastructure, our ports, ships come in at the coastlines. A lot of our airports are built directly along the coastlines. So this is all exposed infrastructure that gets impacted by coastal sea level rise. And as I, I've kind of covered in this presentation so far, there's a very wide range of sea level processes that can cause coastal impacts. So we need to understand how all these things combine to create the assessments that are to, to make assessments about these future coastal impacts. So kind of finish up here before I get into a demo, I want to talk about one specific coastal impact. And this is high tide flooding. So this high tide flooding, it, it was previously called nuisance flooding, right? So that's, it's a low level of flooding. Maybe it's not something you really need to worry about that much. It's a nuisance. It bothers you, it annoys you. It's a pesky problem that occurs. That's, that's previously how it was known. Um, but this high tide flooding is already a problem along the U.S. coastlines. And it's generally, as I said, annoying minor flooding that occurs at high tides. The definition is kind of right there in the name. It's high tide flooding. It's flooding that occurs at high tides. Um, and it happens in low-lying coastal locations. And it's viewed as separate from storm-related flooding. So when you have a big storm that's coming up the coastline um, and that's causing storm surge and flooding, that's different than what I'm talking about here. But this high tide flooding impacts coastal communities very broadly. So it can cause businesses to close, cause transportation problems. It can cause utility challenges. Over time, it can start to impact coastal infrastructure. If there's repeated and chronic high tide flooding, it can, it can really start to do damage. That's part of the reason we don't use the term nuisance flooding anymore, because increasingly it's, it's more than a nuisance. And especially as we go into the future, it's going to become a bigger and bigger problem. So trying to make assessments of these high tide flooding are really critical when you're talking about planning for coastal communities. And I also want to note, and I, I kind of touched on this, high tide flooding is not always minor. So I previously lived in coastal Virginia, so I showed that subsidence map for Hampton Roads. I was an assistant professor at Old Dominion University. And one thing that's interesting about this particular area, there's a lot of water, right? So it's surrounded on three sides by water, this town in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, and then obviously if sea level starts to go up, then you would expect there to be a lot of problems that occur. And not only that, so I, I purchased a house directly across from the water. So I could see it out my front yard. Um, I could see the sea level going up and down, depending on what was going on. The wind was blowing a certain direction. So I had a really good frontline view of the sea level increase that was occurring. And shortly after I, I moved there, I started to see things like this happening. So this is what we call high tide flooding. And that's about I don't know, six inches to a foot. So about 20, 30 centimeters of sea level that we see on this road. Some people are making the best of it, obviously enjoying, uh, enjoying the flooded road. Um, but you can see that it becomes very difficult to get around some of these different, uh, different areas when flooding like this occurs. A couple other images. So this is about a little more than that. So on the order of about 50 centimeters of water that we're seeing on one of the main roads. So there's a really big naval base, U.S. naval base that's in Hampton Roads in Norfolk. And this underwater here, you can't see it because it's underwater, but this is a road that actually leads from the naval base to the university. So one of the main roads in Norfolk and Hampton Roads underwater because of this high tide flooding. And then just one more image here. So this is actually an underpass. So obviously when things flood, it collects in the lowest spots. Uh, underpass has become a particular problem. This car apparently at some point thought it could make it through the water and got stuck. And then as the water continued to increase, now all you can see is the antenna and very top of the roof there. So again, this high tide flooding, previously a nuisance, it can often be much more than that. And then to show how the high tide flooding has changed in the past. So this is the hours above the high tide flood threshold in Norfolk, Virginia. So this is the increase that we've seen from about 1920 on up to the present. So what you can see here is that there's been this pretty dramatic increase in the amount of high tide flooding that's occurring in the past couple decades. You do see some changes year to year that's associated with that natural variability I was talking about previously. But over time, you see this increase that's occurring. All right, so what we've done recently here at NASA is tried to put the pieces together. So how many different things drive sea level changes 
on these kind of local levels, can we put those together to really make an assessment of this high tide flooding and what it's gonna be like in the future? So we put together this statistical framework and what's really important here um, on the left, right? So when you have this change in flooding that occurs because of the mean sea level, it's really important to consider what that change in foundation is doing, right? So on the left there, you have that line that says mean sea level, right? And then you had the flooding threshold and not many of those events that occur over the course of one year got above that flooding threshold. Now, if you look at the right, you have this additional contribution from sea level rise. So your old mean sea level has been increased to a new mean sea level. And now so many more of those events get you into flooding conditions. So you've, a pa you've passed a bit of a tipping point where your flooding increases very dramatically. So what we tried to do in our study was to combine as many of the pieces as possible. We took the natural variability, we took a projection of future sea level, we added those two together, we factored in changes that occur in the tides. So tides vary throughout the course of a year and over the course of decades. Your high tide is not always the same. We took that into account. And then we also evaluated relative to a flooding threshold. So when you put all those pieces together in this statistical framework, you can get to a projection, that, that green box down at the bottom, of high tide flood days in the future for a given location. All right, so the first piece of this is the background projection, right? So a lot of you may have seen some of the recent discussion about the IPCC assessment report that just came out, and that there's different scenarios for our future. So based on the emissions that are going on on a global level, we don't know exactly what sea level is going to do. There's uncertainty there because of what we do as a global population to counter the effects of climate change. But what we end up doing in terms of sea level projections is coming up with a range of projections, right? So we try to account for the future possibilities. We get a range of projections. In this case, we're using them from NOAA. So that's it. The, the U.S. government agency that provides this information is tasked with putting out this future guidance. We're using their projections. And their projections go from anywhere from 30 centimeters by 2100 on up to two and a half meters by 2100. So we took some of these different scenarios and we made that assessment for high tide flooding with those. We also had flooding thresholds. So these flooding thresholds are gonna change depending on where you are um, across the globe, right? So a different location will flood at a certain sea level height than another, right? So we really have to understand for a given location what the threshold is. And NOAA actually also provides these as well. So we took these NOAA derived flood thresholds they do this for the um, United States and um, uh, for, for all parts of the United States. So we have this assessment that we can make in terms of the thresholds. And then we also assess the tidal variations. So a big one that occurs is this, what we call the moon wobble or lunar nodal cycle. Okay, so this is a change in tides that occurs every 18.6 years. So it's a slight tilt in the orbit of the moon around the earth and it causes tides on Earth to change. Um, and it doesn't cause a huge change on the order of about five centimeters between the peak of this wobble and the, the minimum, the, the bottom of the wobble. But that five centimeters, when you combine it with that background threshold and how close we are to the tipping point, it can really cause flooding conditions to occur. All right, so if we put all these pieces together, we can come up with an assessment of high tide flooding. I'm showing this for four separate locations, Honolulu, Boston, La Jolla here in California, then St. Petersburg, Florida. So we can make this assessment, this projection of high tide flood days in the future. And one thing that's really important to note here is that you get a, there's a time period where it's relatively flat. You don't see much of an increase in high tide flooding then all of a sudden you see this very rapid increase. And we call this the, the year of inflection, but it's really when you undergo a paradigm shift where you go from not much flooding to a great deal of flooding over a relatively short time period. And by short time period, we mean from one decade to the next. So we tried to evaluate this year of inflection. And what we found is that for a lot of the coastal locations that we evaluated, this year of inflection actually happens very soon. So, if you look at that top panel there, that year of inflection is listed for a variety of regions here in the United States. We have the Caribbean, the Pacific Islands are included and in various regions along the, um, the continental US. 
But you can see so many of those locations happen before 2040. So the vast number of our, if we're looking at the top panel, the vast number of our years of inflection occur between tw before 2040. So that means for the majority of these locations, we're expecting a very rapid increase in high tide flooding based on this combination of factors in the next two decades. Now, one thing to note is that the that if the threshold is a little bit higher, so say we're not talking about minor flooding, we're talking about moderate flooding, these projections change, but also the scenario. So here we're using the NOAA intermediate scenario. So that's one meter of sea level rise by 2100. But if we're on say the scenario that's one down from that, so say 50 centimeters by 2100, our assessments, our projections get much more optimistic. So you might start to see that year of inflection pushed out further into the future. So that underlying scenario, that projection of sea level really does impact our assessment of these coastal impacts. And then one other result here that we did, we actually looked at the clustering of these events. So when I say there's gonna be an additional 50 days of high tide flooding at some point in the future, those 50 days are not spread evenly throughout the course of a year. They're actually clustered at different time periods during the year. So you, you might actually see in your coastal location a month where you have flooding every single day. And that's really what we're trying to assess here is when do you see the peak, what would the peak month be under these different projections in these, in these future decades? So if we just take Honolulu, for instance, there from 2035 to 2039, under this particular scenario, you would expect an average or a, a peak year of about eight or nine days per month. But as you go forward into the future, so 2050 to 2054, your peak month is going to be up to 25 days of flooding a year. So these are a, a month. So these events are going to cluster. So again, trying to put these pieces together, the timing of them, it's really important when you're trying to make this assessment. All right, so kind of stepping back and, and understanding what NASA is trying to do in order of trying to understand the underlying science of sea level, but also to provide useful information for planners, practitioners, coastal populations. So satellites are going to play a critical role in monitoring the processes that cause sea level to change. I've talked about a lot of those satellites that we use, the processes they measure, and give you an indication of how you put these pieces together to make an evaluation. So what can NASA do to provide useful information? So it really requires these integrated assessments and a dedicated translation activity in order to get this into the hands of planners and to those that actually need this information. So what NASA did was uh, created the NASA Sea Level Change Team in 2014. This is the team I lead. Um, it's 70 plus scientists from government and academia so spread across the United States. And our public face, kind of our outlet for our information is the web portal at sealevel.nasa.gov. So that was a really important part of this effort for us to put out tools and guidance, give easy access to the underlying data, to the satellite data. Um, I'm gonna show some of those tools and do a demo in just a minute. But we have two goals of this team. One is to provide improved forecasts of sea level across a range of time scales. So that's really a scientific goal. Our other is to connect with practitioners and stakeholders to define and provide useful sea level information, right? So it's how do we take our improved scientific understanding and actually generate guidance that's useful? All right. so. I'm going to step out of the presentation and go into sealevel.nasa.gov and show you some of the tools we've developed, how you can use those tools to try to understand what is happening in your particular location. So getting an assessment of how sea level has changed in the past, the processes that are contributing to that sea level change, and what that means for the future. So we're going to kind of span the full range here. We have the data analysis tool, which gives us a look at some of the satellite data that we've talked about. We have what we call the Virtual Earth System Laboratory, which we'll talk about with those ice sheet fingerprints. We have a sea level evaluation assessment tool where we have kind of that budgeting activity. I did it on a global scale, but we also do that regionally where we try to put the pieces together to understand the sea level change that's happening. We have uh, a very recent IPCC AR6 sea level projection tool. So this is a easy access to the projections that are provided um, by the AR6. And then last, similar to what I just showed with that case study, we have um, a tool where we put all the pieces together and talk about the amount of flooding days in the future. 
So I'm going to step through each of these and talk about how they connect and how you can actually provide or get useful information about your particular location from these tools. All right. So let me make this a little bit bigger. So this is our web portal at sea level.nasa.gov. Um, and there's a wide range of information here. I'm going to go into the data tools in just a minute, but I just want to, to walk through some of the information we have on here uh, first. So we have the same way that I talked about in our presentation. We have a variety of, of information related to what we see from the different satellites. So here we have that, that time series, like I showed in the presentation, of global mean sea level. Get a short explanation of what you're actually looking at, why it's important. Um, what it means. And you can do that for the satellite altimetry. You have it here for the gray satellites. Same thing. And then also for Argo, for the steric heights. So you can get easy access to this information. You can interact with some of the data in a very simple way like this. Um, we also have these understanding sea level pages. So if I click on overview here, you get really nice explanations of why sea level is changing and a discussion of the observations that we use in order to understand this change. And we do break it down by uh, global and regional sea level. So if I click on global, you'll see these different contributions, exactly like I discussed, kind of ice melt and thermal expansion. If I click on regional sea level, you can see there's many other effects. So regional sea level, there's just more things that contribute to it, but you'll see a discussion of each of those as well. And then the key indicators is similar to what I showed on the previous slide, where you can get this easy access to the, 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 the uh, data in some of these time series. So there's a, a whole wealth of information that kind of underscores and, and adds some additional content to what I presented in the presentation. But I want to focus on the data tools. So I mentioned these tools already. There's a wide range of tools here that you have access to in the list. I'm going to go through each one of these in a particular order where we can kind of see what information you can get out of them. So when you go into this tool page, so again, I click data and then data tools, you can get a little more information. So you have two options. One, you can just launch the tool. The other, you can get some details about that tool. So you can get a little explanation of what this is showing, how it might be useful. Some of these contain more information than others. Um, but the first one I'm going to go into is this data analysis tool. So if I click on launch the tool, it'll take just a second. So this data analysis tool allows us to very easily compare the data that we have from the satellites and other observations, see what's happening on a regional scale, do some simple comparisons between variables, and just gives us a really quick and easy look at the data. And we're going to focus in on the satellite altimetry data as soon as this opens up. It's loaded. To, occasionally takes a little bit to load. Um, all right. So there's some information here that, uh, that can be useful. Um, certainly is the, the first time you go into this. I'm going to do a, a little demo here. So you can move around anywhere here on Earth. You can zoom in easily. So I'm actually going to zoom in on one particular island here in Puerto Rico, and we'll focus on that. Um, but to start to work with the data, so to select data, you're going to go up to this panel here. It says My Data. Click here to select and modify data layers. So I'm going to choose that, and you're given a whole host of options here. So the one I want to look at is what we call sea surface topography. Okay, so that's kind of a fancy name for the sea level that is measured from satellite altimeters, right? So that's what I showed those maps that uh, everything's propagating around, moving around. I could pull up that particular data set and we can, we can look at it really easily. Okay, so I'm going to click there and you're left with a couple options. The one I want is the sea level anomaly or the measures product. And it goes from 1992 to 2019, so again, covering that time period of altimetry. If you want a little more information, you can click here, and you can see exactly which satellites that it comes from. So you have these JSON satellites that are listed, the Topex Poseidon, and you get a little bit of information about what this data set is showing. All right, so what I'm gonna do is click this little plus sign right there, and it's gonna pull up the data. And it's pulling up the data for one specific date. So this is December of 2018. Okay, so since I'm just looking at this data set, I'm going to go ahead and close that panel there. And you can see how sea level is changing. And you can certainly click on different months and see how things change. So going back in time here. So you can definitely do that. And I'm actually, let's go back to one particular. Um, so let's go to 2016 
and the beginning of the year, I'm just going to show you one particular feature. So this is when we had a really big El Nino, just to confirm that this data is what we'd expect it to be. Let's go back here. So you have this big El Nino that's set up in the ocean there, right? Okay, so this is what it looks like from a global view. I'm going to zoom back in here, and we're going to do a little bit of a simple data analysis. All right. So now I can I can also I should note you can also adjust the color bar nice and easily. I'm going to leave that alone for now, but I'm going to click on this button here. So this is analysis. It allows you to select a particular region or point and and start to understand exactly what's happening in terms of the data analysis. So if I click right here, I have a number of different options. So I can draw a box. So I can kind of take a box around a particular location, and this tool will average within that box. I can draw a profile line, but in this case, I'm just going to what I call drop a pin. So I'm going to select one location, and I'm going to do it just off the southern coast of Puerto Rico. So I'm going to select this location here. Okay, and then I want to pull up the data, the underlying data from the altimetry for that, that particular uh, location. So I wanted to show the time series and my start date. I'm going to go all the way back to 1993 in January, right? So I said that's the first, one of the first dates from the altimetry, and I'm going to move this forward as far as possible. So we'll do January of 2019. We are still collecting satellite altimetry data. This uh, particular data set just ends on 2019. We're in the process of updating that. But from there, I can click create the chart, and if everything works correctly, this pops up. Okay, so for this location, I'm able to very quickly see the sea level change as measured by satellite altimetry um, for this spot in the ocean. So now there's a number of things I can do. So there is a very strong seasonal cycle in this data. So seasonal cycle is basically the warming and cooling that occur occurs over the course of the year. So it's exactly what it sounds like. It's the season. So at, at a particular time of the year, the ocean is warmer than at another time. So I can de-season this data. And you see that a lot of that up and down that occurs over the course of the year has been removed. And I can take this one step further. So I want to know the trend that's occurring in this data set, right? I want to know the rate of rise that's that's occurring. So I can click trend type and linear, and it's going to fit this line to the data, right? And this is in units of meters. Okay, so I know that's uh, looks like a very small number, but if I if I convert that to millimeters, same as I um, as we were looking at for global mean sea level, we see that our rate of increase here is 2.4 millimeters per year from 1993 to 2019. So the rate of increase in this particular location is actually a little bit less than the global average. So over the same time period, we have 3.3 millimeters per year of change that's occurring. And it's important to, to note that there is a lot of variability that occurs, right? So we fit this line and we see that there is this increase but from year to year, there's huge changes that are actually present in this. So back in 2000, you had this really steep decrease in sea level associated with most likely natural variability. So it's nothing that's going to be persistent or last longer, very long. So you can see it comes back up. And then at other time periods, you see these very sharp increases in sea level. Okay, so while that long-term increase is very important, so too is the up and down that occurs um, from year to year. And then we're going to do one other thing in this tool. So we can do comparison data. So we can pull up a data set to compare. And I'm going to pull up the data from GRACE. Okay, so this is the water equivalent thickness. So this is basically converting the measurement from GRACE into a sea surface height. So I'm going to select that. You can see my time period is a little bit different here, right? So it gives me this warning. But it's basically just saying that my time period is different than what I have above here. And I'm going to create this chart. Does it on top of the, this other one. And you can see the increase that's occurring. This black line is the GRACE data. Okay, So you can see that GRACE, the contribution from ICE, has been positive over the same time period. So if I, again, select this, um, let's see. I may not be able to select it for GRACE separately. If you undid the sea level, the, the first one, and, and selected GRACE, you could get the trend associated with it. But you can see the increase that's occurring in GRACE over the same time period. It's a little bit of a different amount relative to what we see in total sea level, but you can make these very nice, easy comparisons. I should note one other thing, if you're interested, you can um, certainly do this kind of running mean average. So it, it uh, filters the data 
um, if you wanted to. So you can play around with this a little bit. Um, but just to note, there's a wide range of other data sets that are available here. Many other things you can go in, look at, and use. Um, so really easy access, really easy time series analysis that you can get in this tool. All right, so I'm gonna shift to the next one here. I'm gonna go into this virtual earth system laboratory and I did show some results in the um, presentation from this. I'm gonna scroll down here. So there's a lot of different things you can look at, but I wanna look at one in particular. So this is the gradient fingerprint mapping. So this gradient fingerprint mapping is basically just an assessment of the ice sheet fingerprints. So if I have a particular location and I wanna know how much ice melt from say Greenland or Antarctica contributes to that location, I can go into this gradient fingerprint mapping tool and very easily see um, my, the, the contribution for, for a particular location of instance or for of interest. Okay, so again, there's some information here. I'm gonna skip this, but certainly when you go through it the first time, you can, you can read that. There's more information here in terms of what, uh, uh, of what you're looking at. So again, this is very, very good information. Just in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this, but feel free to read this uh, the first time you interact with the tool. All right, so I showed this plot previously. So this is the local relative sea level contribution from these different ice sources, right? So this is for New York City. This comes from the Gray satellite, and you can see exactly what I showed you on the, um, the previous uh, presentation. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select some different locations here. So let's start with Key West, right? So as soon as I click on Key West, I can see down here the total contribution from um, ice melt and then also what you get from the ice in the ocean. And then you can see the breakdown for different locations. So again, you can see that Greenland for Key West compared to New York has a much bigger contribution. So let's click that again. So Greenland here is about 0.6 millimeters per year. If I just go a little bit up the coast, I think that's New York, you can see my contribution is, let's see, it's about the same for Greenland, Never mind. But if I, uh, so let's keep going further north. There you go. So as you go up to Nova Scotia, you can see how much that uh, increase drops off for Greenland, right? So now you only have less than 0.1 millimeters per year. Now, if I kind of do the opposite, let's, so let's go down and let's pick this, uh, this is Auckland, this is in New Zealand. And now you see this huge contribution from Greenland relative to the contribution from say the Antarctic, right? So using this tool very easily, you can see where ice mass contributions are coming from. I just zoomed way out there, which I did not mean to. But um, you can click on any location around the globe, see how these changes are occurring. The other nice feature, if I click back here on New York, uh, New York, right, I can see exactly these, these different ice sources, how much each are contributing. So you can see that parts of Greenland contribute more than others. So the darker the red, the bigger the contribution. If I go down to West Antarctic, you can see much bigger contributions as well. Um, right, so you, this is a really nice tool to be able to go in and see exactly where you're losing ice from um, and, and how it's contributing to your particular location. So it's that idea of being able to have a process-based understanding of the sea level change that occurs. All right, so a couple more tools to show here. So the next one I want to show is the sea level evaluation and assessment tool. So this is where we start to try putting the pieces together. So again, there's an explanation here, but this is a budgeting tool. So I showed that, budget, that budgeting that um, we were doing on the global scale. Here you can do it on more regional levels. So there's a couple options. So let me zoom in one here. Um, I can change the global map. So this is the contribution of total sea level measured by altimetry. So this is my trend from altimetry. I can just look at the GRACE contribution. So you can see it's relatively flat, although you do see some of the contribution from the ice sheet, the, uh, ice sheet fingerprints where you have sea level fall. And then I have the contribution of just the ocean. So this is what you can kind of infer from Argo. And you can see how these things add up. But what I'm gonna do is click on this US gauges piece and I can select a particular gauge. Um, so again, let's use Key West. And when I click on Key West, I start to, I can see a breakdown very easily of the different contributors to sea level change over the past couple decades. So we have ocean, land, the ice and water cycle um, for 
these different contributors and how they stack up and combine. So if I sum each of those up individually, I get a trend of 5.4 millimeters per year. I have a tie gauge in Tide West, so I can compare, or a tie gauge in Key West, sorry. So I can compare how that sum equals the average of the, um, from the tie gauge. And you can see that they compare quite nicely. So this is the residual, the difference between the two of about 0.3 millimeters per year. So we're able to explain the trend that we see at the tie gauge um, location in Key West very well. So again, it's this kind of budgeting study where we're breaking down the individual pieces. You can get much more information about each of these individual contributions here. We also have a simple comparison between the altimetry data and the tie gauge data at that particular location. And you can turn subsidence on and off. So again, the altimetry is not going to measure subsidence, the tie gauge will. So I can turn that on and off and uh, see the contribution. It's not very dramatic in Key West. It will be in other locations, um, but yeah. And then this last piece here, I can see the tie gauge, so I can get easy access to the tie gauge data by clicking on that location. It takes me to download the tie gauge data, and then I can also get the GPS data that's nearby. So this gives us an assessment of the subsidence. Um, but right now, these are just for the continental US, but very soon we're going to have an update. It'll, it'll be global in scope. You'll be able to click on tie gauges across the globe. Um, and for many of the island nations that are that are most impacted by sea level, we'll also be able to to do the assessment there as well. All right, so a couple other quick points to hit here. So I'm going back to this data tool page. And this is our most recent tool. This is the um, AR6 sea level projection tool. So it's basically offering up the projections that came out of the most recent IPCC report. Again, you can click on more for more information there, but the, the, this tool is relatively straightforward in what we're trying to accomplish. So we're really just trying to deliver future projections for a um, individual location, right? So with this tool, I can click on any location uh, across the globe. I can click in the open ocean away from a tight gauge. Um, I can also adjust the underlying map. So this is total sea level and 2100 for one of the scenarios so again, I talked about the different emission uh, pathways that we have um, on global scale. We don't know exactly what those will be, but we can adjust our possible futures and understand how sea level might change. So let's take the worst case. So this is the highest scenario. We'll go out to 2150. I'm going to close this. And I'm going to update the map. And you, you can see how big the contributions are, right? Again, this is worst case assessed by the IPCC, the, the recent report, the sea level rise that's occurring. But I wanna drill down into, let's look at what you can get from one particular location. And I'm gonna focus on Magoya's Island, the tie gauge that's there. Um, so if I click on full projection there, I can get the projection associated with any scenario for that one location. So you can see the name of the gauge, the location is up here at the top. And I can cycle through these different scenarios. So here's the lowest end scenario. So this gives me a, a projection of about 0.7 meters by 2150. If I keep going up, you can see it's going up a little bit, point, almost 0.8, a little over a meter by 2150, on up to the higher scenario, which is two meters by 2150, and um, with a very high end possibility, right? So it, it could be much higher than that with this worst case scenario. Um, I can get the data. So if I click on get data for this particular location, it'll download an Excel spreadsheet with this information. So you can very easily go in and start working with the data yourself. There's also a table of values. So one thing I didn't show on the previous slide, we can actually get the projection for each individual contribution. So again, it's that process level understanding that we're very interested in. We can understand the contribution from each of these individual processes. So if we talk about the main contributor to uh, this particular location, you can see that stereodynamic sea level, so that's the thermal expansion um, and sea level, that has a big contribution as you go into the future, and these are all for 2100. But the mountain glaciers, Greenland, Antarctica, they all contribute quite a bit to this location as well. And then you can see the totals that come out for each of the scenarios, and then the rates. So these rates are important because if you, um, this is very close to that location I selected in the data analysis tool and showed 2.4 millimeters per year. 
but it's showing that that rate from 2040 to 2060 is going to increase to 5.1 millimeters per year. So it's almost going to double um, over this time period um, or in those future decades, and it'll continue to increase going forward. So it's really important to understand that it's while we may be seeing low rates now, the projection is that these rates will increase and accelerate into the future. So you can choose any location on the map, very easily get the data here. I think this is a really nice tool for people that don't have immediate access to projections. Um, in the United States, we have a lot of projections in a lot of our different states and cities, but for other locations around the globe, there is an easy access to this, um, these projections and information to report. So this is a really nice delivery tool. Um, of those projections. All right, then the last tool here is the um, high tide flooding tool. All right, so this allows a user to go in and make that assessment for um, a particular location, understand how high tide flooding is projected to change in the future. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna choose that same location. So we do have an assessment here from Agoyas Island in Puerto Rico. And it's gonna pull up, it already updated the um, different curves here. So what this is showing is the projection for three different future scenarios. So I talked about those NOAA scenarios previously. The red is intermediate high, the blue is intermediate low, and then this orange color is in between, it's the intermediate. Um, so depending on the scenario, your projection of future high tide flooding changes very significantly. And you can see how rapid the increase that occurs in some of these uh, for this particular location, depending on the scenario. So if you're approaching intermediate high, what this tool says is that you're going, you should expect almost flooding every single day of the year by 2050. It's important to note that we're not currently tracking intermediate high, so it's maybe a little bit of a pessimistic assessment. Um, but what you can also do is change the flooding threshold, right? So every location has a different flooding threshold. I talked about this. We can try to make a overall assessment, but in a lot of locations, people know at what height flooding starts to occur. So you can move this forward and you can see that the bigger the threshold, the further out into the future these get pushed. So this is a really nice tool that puts those pieces together, allows you to go in and select a, a particular location and understand depending on how the future of sea level looks, what the projection we follow actually is, your high tide flood assessment is going to change. So another thing we're doing here is trying to take the IPCC AR6 projections, fold them into this to make that direct connection between the two um, different pieces. All right, so I know I went through those tools very quickly, but hopefully they give you an idea of how you can use them, how they're related to each other, there's a whole wealth of information on each of these in, in terms of the full details and the different pieces of each tool that you can go into. And really, the whole goal here is to provide easy access to the data for an individual location and to provide assessments for that same location about future sea level and impacts. And that's really what we're trying to target here with this particular tool. All right, so just to, to wrap up, I think that it's really important in terms of the observations that we have, that we work hard to understand the different processes that are contributing to sea level change, right? So by understanding those processes and having good observations of those processes, we're able to combine them and, pro and provide improved assessments of future sea level. We really will have a better understanding of how sea level is changing in the future based on our understanding of how it's changing now. So these observations I talked about play a really critical role in, in doing that. All right, so I'm gonna leave it there and I'll, I'll be able to take any questions and answer any questions you may have and, and expand on any of the information I went over. I'm gonna hand it off to Erica to cover a little bit about the homework and the certificate attached to, to this work. Um, and then I will follow up and be here for any questions. Thanks. Great. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Ben. And uh, thank you to all of the participants for the questions that you've been typing into the question box. As, uh, as Ben mentioned, he is online um, to answer your questions. So what we've done is we've been gathering your questions on a Google Doc that you see now on your screen. 
And uh, this Google Doc will, will be placed on the RSET webpage uh, for you to reference. However, we will go uh, through each question and uh, we'll be answering each of them uh, verbally. So let's just uh, start working our way down. And uh, if you have additional questions, just keep typing them in the question box and it'll make it on, onto this Google Doc. If we don't get through all of the questions um, during our session today, they will be answered on this document. So let's start with the first one. Uh, between thermal expansion and ice melting, which one is the biggest driving factor for sea level rise? Go ahead, Ben. Right. So uh, it, this is somewhat dependent on the time period that we're looking at. So, so we obviously focused a lot on the satellite record during this um, this study using or this uh, webinar. Sorry, um, using Grace, Grace Follow One, Argo, and the altimetry. So, if we look just at that time period from about 2005 to the present about two-thirds of our global sea level rise so about two millimeters per year is from ice melting and then the other third is from thermal expansion so about one millimeter per year um, so that does again it changes over time and there, i showed that one particular graph that goes back to the, the 19th century uh, or the beginning of the um the 20th century and you do see this kind of interplay this relative contribution shift between the, the different um, different factors uh, but again, when we have really good observations during the past decade or so, um, that's where you see this kind of one-third thermal expansion, two-thirds um, ice melting. Great, thank you. Question two, is there satellite imagery on sea level rise changes for the different islands in the Caribbean, and how do we access this data? So one easy way is, is using that data analysis tool um, that I showed, So and I, and I have the link there for that so that data allows you to look at the satellite altimetry data on a global scale so you're able to click on any location where we actually have altimetry data and then find the the data compute the sea level rise you see for that particular location um, and there is a question about this later on some of those tools that i showed are focused right now just on some of the us and us territories that's really not the goal of what we're trying to do and there's actually a lot of effort going in right now to expanding those out to global scale so um, in the next month or two, we will, we're going to roll out um, some additional analysis that will really open up the, the scope of those tools. So, uh, Especially at NASA with our satellite observations, we're very interested in, in these global observations we have with satellites and making these assessments on global scales. Wonderful. So the next question, and these were questions that were coming on kind of early on, and I think you showed some of these things uh, later in your presentation. However, I think it, it is good to remind people how to access the data, and that's what the next question is related to. Interesting graph showing global mean sea level. I'm wondering how one can get this data. Yes, so for the satellite time period, you can get the data using that link, and I did show that down there. So, so we do have easy access to the data there. There was the one graph I showed that goes back to the 20th century, uh, beginning of the 20th century, as I, I mentioned. That data is not currently available on this site that's uh, attached to a specific scientific study. But anything related to the satellite data, um, we do provide on that uh, on sea level .nasa .gov. Wonderful. Question number four, mean sea level is meaningless without a datum. What is the datum that you're using? Yeah, this this is a good question, and and um, I, I try to clarify. So this comes up a lot with the satellite data because we talk about something called global mean sea level, and that mean sea level at a particular tide gauge location means something that what we mean with the global mean sea level. So in terms of global mean sea level, we're actually talking about the global average sea level. So the mean is more of like an average. So we take all of our altimetry data, average that together to get that global mean sea level. Um, so, but but for satellite altimeters, we do have to measure relative to something. That measurement is relative to what we call the geoid. Um, tie gauges and kind of the local data per tie gauge is, is evaluated much differently. I think that's what this question is getting at. But I did want to clarify that global mean sea level does mean something a little bit different. Great, thank you for that. Question five: Satellite derived mean sea level is a global ensemble statistic. Sea level measurements are dynamic and in any given sample must be higher in some places and lower in others. How much variability or standard deviation is there and are there locations where sea level is consistently high or low? Yes, so 
and I think this was kind of covered later in the presentation, that there is so much going on in the ocean, so many different signals on different time scales that cause sea level to go up and down and cause a departure from that global mean. Um, so it's a really good point that that global mean sea level is an average statistic. But as soon as you start looking at a specific location, it's there are many locations that are extremely reflective of that global average. Um, so things like the ice sheet fingerprints, um, changes in ocean dynamics that are, that occur over time, like those are things that will cause departures over long time periods. Um, so when I showed that trend map, that rate of sea level rise that we get from the altimetry, you can see departures from the global average of up to 100%. So our global average is three millimeters per year over those that 30 year time period. Um, at a different location, you can see something like six, seven millimeters per year, right? So we can see big departures over that time period, but on shorter time scales, I showed El Nino, I mean, that's a 25 centimeter increase in some parts of the ocean over a, a year to year time period. And that obviously is, is much different than what we see in the global average where for a, a really big El Nino, you might see a centimeter. So that departure is on the order of 25 times, right? What we see in the global average. Um, so it does depend somewhat on the time scale you're looking at, but um, yeah, that, that global average is a useful statistic and a useful measure to give us an idea of how climate is changing, how the water cycle might be changing. But when you're st starting to talk about local effects, you really do need to look at these smaller spatial scales. Great, Qu question number six. Is there a significance of change in tectonic plates under the sea? Yes, yeah, so, so this is a, a good question. So changes in the ocean basins will impact the sea level change that we measure as, a, as I note there. Um, the, yeah, there, there, there's a variety of processes that cause this to happen. One of the biggest we see, and I didn't mention this in the presentation, is actually associated with the glacial, glacial isostatic adjustment. So this is basically the Earth rebounding from previous loading of ice during past ice ages. So as that ice has been removed, Earth responds, and it actually changes the um, uh, the ocean, the, the ocean basin. So we do see some of these effects. Um, we can, there, there's a whole area of research devoted to trying to understand these effects and how they might get expressed in sea level. So um, yes, this is a factor and it is something we consider. Okay, question number seven. Does El Nino make sea level higher because the East Pacific Ocean is warmer at this phase? Yeah, the simple answer to that. I mean, that that is the, the case. So the warmer water um, causes a thermal expansion to occur, causes sea level to go up. And you just see that opposite effect during a La Nina. You see the seesaw pattern back and forth across, across the tropical Pacific. Question eight, are global warming and El Nino different things? Is there any connection between them? Yeah, I really like this this question because it, it, in some sense, El Nino does cause a warming of the global climate. We do see um, uh, global mean sea level increase as a result of, of El Nino, but it's really the time scales. So there's two things. The process is obviously different. What causes an El Nino is different than what causes global warming, but also the time scales are different here. So when we're talking about global warming, these are persistent increases we see um, over time associated with the increased emissions, so increased greenhouse gases. Whereas El Nino, we know that an El Nino is going to um, show up and then it will subside over the course of a year or two. So it, those time scales are really important when you're separating these two things out. Actually, with our satellite altimeter record, it's still relatively short. I know three decades sounds like a long period of time, but trying to separate the impact from natural variability, like the ups and downs from natural variability, from the background long-term global warming increase we see, it's a very active research area. Um, so this, does, this question hits at a very important uh, research topic, I, I think, and, and something that we really investigate a great deal. Um, and then I have that last note there. there. There is research that shows that El Nino, the frequency severity um, will change as a result of global warming. So there are some model results in that direction. So again, that's something we're looking into. So there is also possibly this direct connection between the two. Question number nine, is it also possible that sea level can increase due to waste deposits, e.g. plastics, at the bottom of the sea? Yeah, I think it's important to consider here just how much water is being lost from these ice sheets. I mean, it's an incredible amount of water that is going into the ocean, um, incredible amount of volume and water mass. Um, same thing with the thermal expansion. It, it, it's an incredible amount of heat that's getting absorbed by the ocean, then it responds and it expands. So 
in terms of relative scales between what we might see from putting waste into the ocean compared to those two, it's really just a completely different scale. But as I note, we shouldn't be putting extra heat, any more melted ice or any waste into the ocean. So all, none of those are, are good things, certainly. Question 10, can you please explain the mechanism behind loss of ice and its impact on sea level decrease around it? Yeah, so the first part of this, and I think this is probably obvious to, to everyone, that when these ice cover portions of the earth warm, the ice melts, right? So that's the first step here, obviously. That meltwater then has to go somewhere and it goes into the ocean. So similar to what I said in the last question, it's just, it's a lot of ice that's being lost. It's a lot of mass that's being lost by the ice sheets over time. So what that means is that the ice sheets are losing so much mass, the gravitational pull towards them is just not as large anymore. So right now, or well, yeah, let's say right now, there, the, um, there's a certain level of gravitational pull associated with this ice. So the water is getting pulled towards that ice sheet. Um, and we can observe that with GRACE and some of these other satellites. Now, as that ice mass gets lost, the gravitational pull decreases. And what happens is that water that was getting pulled pretty significantly towards the ice sheet is not getting pulled quite as much. So that pull has decreased and then the sea level directly around the ice sheets actually starts to go down. Now the, that meltwater that goes into the ocean from the ice sheet actually gets distributed across the earth, right? So it goes across the globe. Um, I show those ice sheet fingerprints, but it does fill up the global ocean. Um, but again, in a very near vicinity, it really is that gravitational pull, the reduced gravitational pull that causes the sea level to fall. And it does give you an idea of the scale of the ice mass loss that, um, that, that is actually occurring. Question 11. Many countries have established a vertical datum database of points that are used for various applications, including planning of engineering structures. The datums are based on mean sea levels that are basically changing due to global sea level changes as articulated uh, in the training. So what happens to these already established datums? Yes, yeah, so, so in the US at least, so I'm not sure how this happens on, on international scales and in other countries, but um, these, these datums are evaluated and can be updated. Um, and it is well known, obviously, that mean sea level is changing as a result of global warming. So typically, these tidal datums are updated by NOAA every 20 to 25 years as a result of global sea level rise. And actually, um, we've just, I think, recently or is planned to, I haven't really kept track of this, but um, there's a, there's an update that's going to occur or has very recently occurred um, but because of that global sea level rise. So yes, the, the question is very well posed and, and I think we need to consider how those datums change over time because of global sea level rise. Question 12, to what degree is the observed increase also a result of increased um, of an increased amount in of data and or frequency of recording and analysis? It's not that uh, the results are being debating, debated, just wondering what is the impact of additional and more refined data? Yeah, so there's, there's two things that the, the better data is getting us. One is that we just are, we have much more definitive estimates of the sea level rise. So I showed early on that picture of the tide gauges where we have measurements at individual locations. Now with the satellites, we can actually get a good global view. We can do these global averages. We can understand how the spatial um, variability might be aff affecting sea level rise. So um, we do have much better measurements and much more definitive estimates of, of sea level rise from these satellite measurements. The other thing that these satellites allow us to do is to understand the individual processes contributing to sea level rise, right? So we have the GRACE and GRACE follow on satellites. They tell us the contribution of a mass change. Argo tells us the thermal expansion. We can really assess our under our scientific understanding using these observations. So they allow us to put the pieces together in a way that was very difficult in the past. With all that said, there is a great deal of work that goes into looking at the tie gauges, looking at some of the other observations, including say off of ships, kind of the, the measurements of temperature, ocean temperatures off of ships in the past. So there is a lot of work going into looking at those past observations that maybe are not quite as easy to work with. But from that research, we actually have a pretty good understanding of how sea level has changed and can give context to what we see in the satellite record. Um, so again, we the satellites just make our job quite a bit easier and also allow us to just perform better science, better scientific investigations into sea level rise, both in the past and, and also into, into the future. Question number 
13, if sea level changes have a negative global impact, how can we prevent these impacts at local, regional, and global scales? Yes, so a key on a global scale, so if we're thinking about the biggest picture here, it's, it's to limit and reduce emissions as much as possible. Okay, so this is the best way to limit future sea level rise. We know this. So there's that bigger geopolitical discussion, obviously. On a local scale, um, what we what typically is done is trying to find ways to mitigate the effects, the impacts that are being felt, or adapt to those impacts. There's a wide range of strategies. You can raise infrastructure, so you can raise streets, um, houses, things like that. You can build seawalls. You can potentially move away from uh, particular areas that flood a lot. So there's a whole range of strategies that can take place, and these are really assessed best at, at kind of the local level. Um, so there's a lot of planning activity in different parts of the world. Um, to try to address these these changes. So it is a very difficult problem. So um, prevent is maybe the wrong way to look at it, but we can certainly try to limit the negative impacts while also tackling that bigger emissions um, discussion. Great, so I'm gonna skip number 14 because that's been answered before already. Um, and I'm gonna go to question number 15. What is the best adaptation and mitigation approach for Indonesia to sea level rising at the regional to local scale as island nation? Yes, yeah, so, so I don't um, want to kind of overstep my particular area of expertise. I don't have particular knowledge of, um, say, Indonesia. I, I understand some of the physical processes that are causing the sea level problem, but not the adaptation or mitigation strategies that would be most effective. I will say from the science perspective, it's very useful and important for us as scientists to convey our understanding of the processes that are contributing to sea level rise. So for instance, subsidence is a big issue in Indonesia. Having good observations of subsidence, communicating that to planners, that does help to understand what might happen in the future and what strategies might be most effective. So um, yeah, I, I don't have a, a direct answer to this question other than to say it's really a, an across the board approach where the scientists have to communicate the understanding to the planners who then make that more local assessment. Question number 16, if dams and reservoirs have affected sea level, how do droughts affect it? Where is all the water going in the global water balance? Yeah, this is an interesting question and it ties back into El Nino and La Nina. So actually with, when we have a La Nina, for example, we actually have a net movement of water from ocean onto land. So when you have a, a La Nina, you actually see global mean sea level go down a little bit. And you have the opposite with El Nino. So you see slightly more water going into the ocean than on land. So there's this constant interplay and these changes to the global water cycle that occur. Um, I will say that a drought at any one location is probably not going to be enough to affect global mean sea level. But if you have these, global climate cycles like El Nino or La Nina that can really affect the movement of water between ocean and land, then it does start to show up. Um, so yes, the, the water cycle is a big driver of that, what we call interannual or year-to-year -year variability um, in global mean sea level. Question number 17, can the tools at the NASA sea level portal be used to assess sea level change and rise in other countries as well, or is it just for U.S.? territories? So some of the tools I showed are, are global in scope and then other ones are we're working in that direction. So our hope is that it's we, we really don't want to make these U.S. focused. I know that some of them are right now, but the goal is to really expand them out to global scales and, and hopefully that'll be happening in the next month or two. Okay, and uh, along the questions of the tool, can I use these tools to project flooding along the shores of an inland lake like Lake Victoria? Yes, so so um, the IPCC projections don't um, cover the inland lakes. Um, some of the other tools that I showed, and if you click around into some of the tools that are on the, the sea level.net that I that I didn't show, you could start to get some useful information for some of these inland lakes. But um, I, I, I guess just as a general note, we don't really we don't target these areas necessarily with with the data we're providing. Yeah, I'll just add that there is a, a, a separate project that is using altimetry to look at um, change, water level change in inland lakes. And I can um, include that link here in this document later on. So question 19, is it possible to download different satellite data for individual sites as a CSV file? 
Yeah, I don't, so I don't think, I need to double check. And I, I don't think we have this for the data analysis tool as a CS, CSV file. I think there's other file formats to download, which I need to check. Um, in general, though, we're assessing all of our tools to try to make that data more accessible and have it downloadable in a number of different formats. We did this with the IPCC projections, so that is downloadable as a CSV file. Um, and we're trying, again, we're trying to assess this across all of our tools. So um, yeah, stay tuned on that one. Great, a question number uh, 20. Can the NASA tool be used to model or simulate inundation due to sea level rise or high tide flooding at a local scale? Yes, yeah, so, so the way I interpreted this question is, is kind of, um, you have a coastline and you see how much of that coastline gets lost potentially as a result of these projections. So we don't have that available um, for these IPCC projections. Other organizations do. So uh, Climate Central is one that actually has some tools in that direction. Um, but but I, I would say that the high tide flooding tool, I showed those assessments. Um, they, yeah, it, it, there, there is an additional step to kind of visualize that in a map form, but they do provide those kind of projections to understand when flooding might occur. So that high tide flood tool in particular it really is an assessment being made that when we reach this threshold in the future, you would expect flooding to occur in, in your particular uh, location. So, um, yes, yeah, so, so I guess the direct answer is I don't think we have exactly what this question is asking for, but there are some useful pieces to get you to that, that step. Great. Question 21. Does natural sea level variability have to do with astronomical gravitational changes? Um, yes, so, so uh, the tides are obviously a really big um, effect that we see in the ocean, and that, that was I discussed that a little bit in the um, the high tide flood tool, in particular the lunar nodal cycle or the moon wobble that happens over the course of a couple decades. That is going to be a big driver of increases in flooding in the coming decades. Um, so yes, the answer is uh, there is this natural variability. It's taken place. Um, for as long as humans have been around, it continues to be a factor. I think an important thing to note is that as we increase that foundation of sea level I talked about in the presentation, these natural factors that weren't a problem in the past will start to drive and lead to flooding in the future. So it's really that combination between the natural variability and the, um, the, the global warming that we see. All right. Um, I, do we have access to this platform? Yep. Question so. Uh, yeah, so sea level.nasa.gov is um, is open uh, to everyone, and um, feel free to, to go check it out. There's a lot of information that I didn't show in this this webinar that uh, could be useful as well. And then I also provided the link directly to the tools I showed. Question 23, and this is a question along the INSAR um, approach that you discussed to look at subsidence. How do SAR polarizations VV and VV, VH affect the observations? Um, I'm not entirely sure I understand the framing of this question, other than to say that they don't really affect our observations, our ability to to um, assess subsidence. Um, yeah, it, it's a little bit of a different kind of processing that we're doing, um, separate from this particular question. Right. And I can also add to this question some links to INSAR uh, RSET trainings that we've done, if anyone wants to really dig into uh, INSAR. Question 24, what DM are you using when analyzing flooding and how is accuracy, how is the accuracy of the DM taken into consideration in the flooding extent, depth, and recurrence? Yes, yeah, so we're not using um, any DMs in, um, in the analysis, the flooding analysis I've shown. So that, that high type flooding is basically a user-defined threshold, flooding threshold, and by user, I mean that NOAA potentially provides those in some locations, but we also allow someone who has better knowledge of a local area to adjust, adjust that threshold. To connect this back to the other question that was asked about kind of uh, flooding simulations, you would ideally need very accurate DEMs. So, th so those DEMs are a big driver of your ability to do the um, kind of flooding uh, mapping and flooding modeling that, uh, that was discussed previously. So there is work being done as part of uh, a, a number of groups within NASA, but um, I didn't discuss any or show any results associated with DEMs in this, this particular presentation. Question 25, is there a relationship between sea level rise and solar cycles? 
So the, the most direct answer to this question is asked is no. So um, in terms of sea level rise, the long-term sea level rise that we see and observe, um, there's no relationship between solar cycles and that increase in sea level. Um, we have a really good understanding that that long-term increase that we are observing is associated with global warming. Okay, uh, question 26. When comparing small island developing states in the Pacific and in the Caribbean, we often hear about sea level rise impacts in Pacific island states and not much in the Caribbean. Can you confirm with this space-based data that one can see such trends? Yes, so, so with the satellite data and our understanding that we have of, of sea level rise from these satellites, we do see increases in sea level in the Caribbean. Um, yeah, I, I think that part of this is is a difference in drivers of the sea level rise and, and the signals that are that are observed. So, I mean, certainly hurricanes are a bigger factor um, than some of the Pacific Island states. So, it, it's a, it maybe a different framing. Um, yeah, I, I don't. Hopefully, with this presentation, I didn't uh, necessarily preferentially treat any any particular area, but because we do have good observations of um, of the Caribbean in addition to other parts of the world. Question 27, what tools and layers would be the ones to use in order to build scenarios for sea level rise for projections showing inventories of building structures? Um, I'm trying to think how that, yes. So you would, num you would want to tie together a number of things. So um, the, certainly the projections, so the, the long-term projections from the IPCC would be important. You would want going connecting back to the previous question a really high, um, highly accurate, high resolution DEM as well. So in order to make that assessment, um, and then trying to put those pieces together, the high tide flooding tool kind of conveys the idea that different time scales of variability are important. So I'm, I'm giving kind of a long-winded answer to your question. You would need a number of tools and layers, including what I show I showed um, to kind of make sense of uh, to do that assessment. We don't, Question we don't, uh, sorry, I was just gonna say, we don't provide that assessment ourselves. Okay. Question 28, does your team have social scientists that develop planning strategies for island nations with this data? And is, if so, is there a link to their work? So I don't currently work uh, formally in a, in a kind of a funded way with any social science uh, scientists. Uh, that's not to say that there aren't connections to social scientists um, within other parts of NASA, just I'm not aware of them. Okay, question 29. Philippines has a small plate. Do you have any recent data that shows the mean global sea level of the Philippines? Yes, so we do have um, estimates of sea level rise in the um, uh, for the, for off the coast of the Philippines from the satellite altimetry. Um, actually, interestingly, in the satellite record, sea level rise off the Philippines has been among the highest in the world, um, which is obviously a problem for a place, a very low lying place like the Philippines. So um, we do have good uh, good estimates of, of sea level rise from 1993 to present off the coast of the Philippines. And, and you can get to that data on the data analysis tool that is available there. Okay, question number 30. How does one acquire data and perform an analysis for sea level rise projections for areas where there are no tidal gauges installed? For example, I'm not seeing a tidal um, map, uh, a tidal gauge map installed on the coast of Sierra Leone. Yes, so the IPCC projection tool, you can actually click on any location in the ocean. So you, you don't have to tie it to a, a uh, particular tie gauge. I think I only showed examples where you click on a tie gauge, but you can actually click on any part in the ocean and, and get the, the estimate. So even if there isn't a tie gauge, you should be able to get the IPCC projection of sea level rise um, for, for any location in the ocean. Um, that said, some of like the high tide flood analysis, it relies on statistics that are available at a tie gauge. So we are somewhat limited in terms of the analysis we do where there is not a tie gauge. But um, yeah, that, that, that's it's ongoing research to try to to understand the sea level rise and the the different threats of flooding in the future for some of these other locations as well. 
Okay, so question number 31. Mean sea level has already been adopted as a vertical datum for measuring the heights of various resources. When it is changing with time, as has been discussed, how does one deal with the changes when we are measuring heights? Yes, so this is very careful communication between those who are assessing mean sea level at a local level or a national level and then those who are actually trying to implement it for um, planning or, or for infrastructure, things like that. So I, I don't have a, a great answer to this other than it, it just needs to be done very carefully and, and documented well, communicated well when these types of changes are taking place. Okay, question 32, is there any interlink between inland wetland with local mean sea level? Yeah, so local sea level is going to affect these wetland areas. Um, so, so, I mean, there, there is a link obviously when, when sea level is increasing at the coast, then how that ex gets expressed at the coastline, including the wetland areas. Um, it, it's yeah something that, uh, very closely connected because the two are geographically connected, right? So they're right next to each other. Um, yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure how else to, to answer that other than, yes, there is a very strong interplay between wetlands and local sea level increase. See, see that other question there? So can we use SAR data to assess changes in coastlines? Um, yes, uh, the answer is uh, yes to that. So um, there is SAR data looking at uh, water extent, um, coastline changes. It's a very useful measurement, not just for the NSAR that I talked about here, but there, there are certainly other applications as well. Great, so we've had a, a number of questions that have not made it on the Google uh, Doc and they're in the uh, window, the question window. So I'm gonna keep working my way down and we'll include these questions um, in the Google Doc eventually or when we, uh, when we uh, uh, make it public. So I'm just gonna um, ask you another question that's, um, that's, that's on the uh, window, question window, Ben. Um, the next one is uh, the question about past data versus current and high precision data was aimed to get at methods that are being used to reconcile differences in accuracy and precision, as well as data collection methods, in addition to number of data points, now versus in the past, and how that variance is accounted for in the models and methods. All right, right. I'm sorry, yeah. I guess. No, that's a, that's a um, it's a good question. I, I understand where where the question is coming from. I'm, so so for instance, if if I talk about one particular case, so I should say there's a lot of different in situ observations we rely on in the past before the satellite record, um, and then the strategies for really trying to piece out the global or regional sea level contributions vary a great deal between those different observing systems. If we focus specifically on the tide gauges. Um, so I showed that map of the tide gauges at the beginning, and there is a geographical distribution to those and a hemispheric bias to those tide gauges. So, for instance, there's more tide gauges in the northern hemisphere compared to the southern hemisphere, and there's more tide gauges located off the coast of North America, Japan, and Europe than there are in other locations. So the strategies we have to come up with to make sense of these observations is really how do you account for those regional differences um that are that we have in the sampling and then still come up with an assessment of global sea level rise for instance and an important piece of that is how do we estimate the uncertainty so it's not just coming up with the estimate but what is the uncertainty on our estimate um, so again there's a number there's a whole wealth of literature out there on, on how to do this type of analysis using the tide gauges and a wide range of strategies even for this one particular example i'm showing um, without getting into too many of those details, I would just say that uh, there, there's people, there, there's a lot of careful work being done, and, and we are able to get estimates from that past record with an uncertainty that's small enough that you can assess a change between what we see in the tide gauges in the past and what we see in the altimetry in the, right now. So it's good enough, and our estimates are good enough that we can see these changes that are happening through time. Um, but I, I think just I want to note that question in, in the previous one, 
really hits at a very important topic. And, and there's just an incredible amount of work that goes into trying to make sense of those observations prior to the satellite record. Great. OK, so another one here on the question window. Is coastal subsidence more likely in small islands, specifically considering decreased freshwater availability and increased water extraction in addition to earthquakes? And is there a way to predict subsidence based on groundwater extraction scenarios via remote sensing? Yeah, so, so I, I'm not sure that I would say that the small islands are more prone to subsidence. I, I will say that a small island that is doing a lot of groundwater extraction, I mean, that, that groundwater extraction is going to be a driver of, of subsidence, certainly. Um, and we've seen this in certain parts of the U.S. coastlines, for instance, when you reduce the groundwater extraction, you reduce the rate of subsidence that it's occurring. So in that sense, if you alleviate or reduce that particular cause, then you are going to see some effect. So in terms of projecting, um, I, I, it's, it's difficult to say the direct relationship between the rate of groundwater extraction and the rate of subsidence, that really needs to be done on a local level. But you would expect to see a change in the amount of subsidence if you're doing, if you reduce the amount of groundwater extraction. Great, so I think we have time for two more questions. The next one is, what is the accuracy of the altitudes calculated by space altimeters at the coastal level? Yeah, so we actually are able to get estimates of, um, and I'm not sure I'm exactly answering the question, but that we're able to get estimates of sea level down to about one inch. Um, so about two and a half centimeters of accuracy, two, two and a half centimeters of accuracy from up on orbit. Um, and, and this, th there's a whole number of corrections that go into um, to making that assessment in terms of atmospheric corrections, understanding exactly where the spacecraft is, trying to correct for how that radar pulse from the altimeter interacts with the surface of the ocean. So once you do all, all that over a, a certain area of the ocean, what we call kind of the spot size, you get about a two centimeter accuracy of that measurement of sea level from space. Okay, and then the last question, ENSO cycles have some interesting teleconnections on precipitation patterns, for example, in, uh, in tropical America, uh, it's becoming more dry during La Nina and Southeast is becoming more wet with exceptional precipitation associated with uh, Northeast monsoons. You mentioned that La Nina is a result of a drop of global, a result in a drop in global sea level mean. With the amount of water that's, uh, as water that's brought up into the atmosphere as water vapor take away from that volume. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Yes. So, so the, the, actually, I, I just published a study on this last year. So it's basically how that water gets taken out of the ocean, the time it, it spends in the atmosphere, and then where it gets dumped on land. So it's there's a, a wide variety of calculations that um, that you have to make in order to assess the where that water sits at any given time. So you do see a lag, for instance, between global mean sea level and then changes in precipitation on land or, or changes in the water mass on land as assessed by GRACE. Um, so so I, I guess I will only note that that is a really good question and it's an active research area and, and important to consider. It's not always extremely obvious how La Nina or El Nino is going to affect different parts of the world. So some areas might see increased rainfall, others might see a decrease. Um, and, and in that movement, it, it does vary from event to event. So every El Nino is not going to be the same. You're going to see a different response and, and potentially a very different regional response as well. So that's something we're looking at very closely. And the satellites are a huge help in, in trying to understand that, that interplay between ocean, atmosphere, and land. Super. Well, thank you for that. And we're coming up to the top of the hour. So I'm going to close this uh, seminar. I just want to remind everyone that we will be opening the homework in the next session. So the next one is on Thursday at the same time. It will be on landslides and we'll have Thomas Stanley from NASA Goddard uh, as our guest speaker. Um, the homework will be due on September 15th. And uh, that will, and yes, so that will be the final um, session on this three-part series. I'd like to thank the RSET team, my colleagues, Amita Mehta, Sean McCartney, and as well as um, 
Brock Blevins, Selwyn Hudson Hodoy, and Jonathan O'Brien uh, for for making this happen. And of course, uh, for our amazing uh, guest speaker today, Dr. Ben Hamlington. Before I close, I'd like to um, uh, pass it over to you, Ben, for some last words. Yeah, thanks, Erica. And thanks to everyone for, for attending this briefing. Hopefully you found it useful. But I, I think the real goal here was to convey just the really improved understanding we have with the, the satellite observations. And a number of these questions that, that came out about trying to get this information in other parts of the world that aren't immediately covered in the tools. I, I do want to note this is something we're very concerned about and, and working hard to do. So be patient and uh, hopefully you'll see some updates in the next next month or two where um, you, if, if you don't already have an assessment from these tools for, for where you're located, hopefully it will be online soon. But uh, thanks to the RSET team and to, to Erica for, for organizing this. And um, yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, Ben, and uh, thanks to all the participants, and stay tuned to our last session on Thursday. Wishing you all a great day. Bye-bye.